que se va a acabar.
are getting ready to close. Um, Okay. 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 So I'll do my comments and then I go back and sit. Okay, great. So we don't have to come back in. Okay, great. Well, let me just put this out. Okay. So you're seated to the first one as a facilitator. You can sit on the second one. And I think if you have some coffee and you snacking with your cup and your cookie, so all this, the main thing is that we all be comfortable. So I hope we've all seen where the bathrooms are. If not, the minute you go out, you need a shop left and you see the sign. So everything is in the way. There's coffee, there's a bathroom, there's art here. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Good morning. Finally, we are ready. Everything is set. And I really would like to take this moment to thank you all for coming through. My name is Linda Vilagazi. I'm a South African. I'm an activist. I'm passionate about development issues. But in particular, I'm very jealous about the work that needs to be done around the issues of equality. So gender equality is one of those issues that is very passionate to me and close to my heart. And to take it even further, issues of the girl child, you know that children are the most vulnerable. So any work like this that focuses the spotlight on improving the lives of the girl child warms my heart. And I'm excited that we are here. As you all know, today is the International Day of the Girl Child. This is a very important day, which was marked by the UN in 2011, when it was declared as a special day to mark work done and to ensure that we share knowledge, we educate each other, we become aware of the challenges and the wins that are being made around improving the lives of the girl child. This is not just a day to celebrate. Because um, the minute we call it celebrate, sometimes we think it's a day to go out and have lunch at a restaurant. No, it's a day to work. And its history is beautiful because for the first time during the Beijing conference in 1995, there was a dedicated focus on the Beijing Declaration Platform of Action. There was a dedicated chapter on the girl child. This was the first time that a dedicated spotlight was reserved just to discuss issues of the girl child. And because of what the Beijing Declaration did, 
it took a number of years to get it now to the day being declared. So we are part of a cycle that continues to ensure that we don't lose focus as we work under development. We don't lose focus on ensuring that we close the gap on the disadvantages that take place and affect the lives of the girl child. So as South Africa and as Africa, because today we are meeting here, not just as South Africans, but we're meeting as Africa. We have friends and colleagues in the room who comes from different parts of this continent. We have friends and colleagues online who comes from all over the continent. And even when it comes to the panel, you will notice as the day goes that there are friends and colleagues across across the across the continent. Um, Good Governance Africa is a friend that I met a few years ago when I was doing work on women in the continent. And they had dedicated a publication at the beginning of 2018 on women in the continent. And I found it quite attractive. I said, who are these people? who produce journals and have just stopped to produce such a good journal that covers all facets, facets of issues around women in the continent. Picked the journal in a pick and pay store, read it, got excited, called them and found that they are such warm people. And I started working with them. Towards the end of last year, I went back and I said to them, but you haven't done any publication on the girl child. They said, yeah, we've touched on it here and there. I said, but how about you dedicate now a publication on the girl child and we use it again as a tool to inform, to influence, to agitate for action out there. And they warmly said yes. And today is the celebration of that. This beautiful publication that you all have in your hands is the amazing work of a collaboration that you will read about in the book of many organizations that care and really wish for an, a world and a continent where equality thrives. And they really put their resources where their hearts are. So we are quite excited to have this webinar today. And you will see from the floor of the speakers, the panelists, that the whole idea is, the, is to put to four the issues that some of us in the room and online work with every day to create space that we know of each other and we can network, we can connect. And if you are just passionate from your armchair at home, we hope that after today you will say, gosh, there's a role for me to play. Even if you don't play that role nationally, if just play that role in your own homestead or in your own community. Just be aware of the issues that are there and just be aware of the beautiful outcome that can come when we approach each other as a full being and we don't label them we don't limit them we don't box them so today it's about learning it's about finding our passion it's about finding your friend and it's about affirming some of you in this room because some of you are dedicated activists who daily deal with these issues and you go home in your lonely space and you're like gosh are my efforts really worth it? And I hope today is going to show you that your efforts are worth it. Um, so with all of that, I welcome you and encourage you to be open-minded. The panelists are simply stimulating you. Within the audience, we have amazing experts. So feel free, open up. When the panelists open the spots, let's hear from you. Let's not only look at the panelists as though they've got it all. They're here also to learn and they're very brave to have given their being to say, I will sit on that chair and give my worth. I want to call at this point very briefly to come and make some introductory comments. My friend, my partner in crime, <laughs> the amazing editor of this magazine, Sue, who has been quite resilient, dedicated in putting this together and editing all your work and ensuring that this is a living document. I'm old school. I don't do online. This you can go to bed with, you can travel with it. You can, please don't kill it. This can live, outlive you in this room and online. So use it, take it with you. It doesn't end today, but it carries on beyond today as a resource. So Sue, please come up and over to you. Thanks, 
Good morning, everyone. It's a very great pr privilege and a pleasure um, for me to be able to welcome all of you here today. Not only me, but on behalf of Good Governance Africa and my colleagues, um, who both are the ones who will be on the panel and in the audience today. And I do notice two former colleagues are in the room as well. And very warm welcome to you too. Um, I would also like to welcome you on behalf of our executive director, Chris Marilang, who I know would very much have liked to have been here today, but at the moment he's busy representing GGA in Europe. So very pleased to see all of you, and I know it's going to be an extremely interesting day. Um, as Linda alluded to, um, Africa in fact is what we like to describe at GGA as our flagship publication. It's a hybrid between an academic journal and a long read magazine. It comes out four times a year. And for the past two years, we have been digital only. So when we are able to form partnerships um, and be able to print the, the publication and get it out to a wider audience, we are very grateful indeed. And at that point, what I really want to say is a very big thank you to our partners, to Linda for her um, persistence and enthusiasm in getting us to this point, um, to the Attorney General's Alliance Africa, uh, Chooks and Kim, very pleased to see you here. Without you uh, or the Telcom Foundation, thank you to Boston City Campus and the Mail and Guardian. We just wouldn't be in the room today, and we certainly wouldn't have been able to uh, do a print run of two and a half thousand copies. Um, it's really, it's, it means a lot to us. Um, I'm a bit old school like Linda. I know um, Lloyd Coote is our head of publications is in the room, and it, he, he is the driver of digital at GGA. And yes, it is wonderful. Digital does give you a lot of opportunities that print very often doesn't. Um, but it's great to be able to have the hard copy in front of me. Um, I have been handed some housekeeping rules, some of which Linda's already mentioned. Uh, the first is cell phones off, obviously. Unfortunately, there isn't a uniform guest um, Wi-Fi password that we can share with you. But if anyone does need, there are a limited number of individual ones. If anyone does need one, please just ask Gail. She has them. Um, the bathrooms, uh, gender neutral, I notice, <laughs> just round the corner. So um, very easy to find. The refreshments and lunch tea breaks, lunch will be outside in the foyer where we all um, met initially. Um, and yes, uh, moderators and panelists, thank you very much. Um, there is a gift bag for each of you, so don't please don't go home without one. Oh, the other thing I did want to say is I uh, really very warmly welcome to the almost 500 people who've joined us remotely online. Um, thank you very much for your support, and I hope everyone, both in the room and uh, remotely, gets a lot out of today. And as Linda said, what we're really looking for are practical proposals and solutions. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask Kim Robertson, Robin, Robinson, sorry, Kim, um, who is the AGA's country uh, coordinator here in South Africa, to um, come up. Welcome. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Deputy Minister, other representatives of government, representatives from NGOs and the corporate sector, activists, concerned citizens, ladies and gentlemen, and friends. Uh, I'm Kim Robinson. I am country coordinator based here in Johannesburg for the Attorney General Alliance Africa. Um, welcome to today's conference uh, entitled The African Girl Child the struggle for health, education, and agency. As Linda said, it's appropriate that we hold this conference today because today is in fact the day, the UN International Day of the Girl Child. AGA Africa is proud to co-sponsor this event with Good Governance Africa, the Telcom Foundation, Boston City Campus, 
and the Mail and Guardian newspaper. You all have a copy. I urge you to read it. Uh, the issue reveals a grim picture of the obstacles many African girls face. Consider the girls and women in your life. Are they survivors? Could you have survived? The point of today is to move from knowledge to action. Based on what we know and who we know, what can we do? Although progress has been made to ensure that the human rights of the African girl child are protected, it is telling that in the 21st century, it is still a struggle for many African girls to actually be educated, to be healthy, and to be children. The reality is that many, too many, African girls face life-altering and life-threatening challenges simply because they are girls. These challenges deprive them of their childhood, assault their dignity, and undermine their ability to self-actualize. But let me get a little concrete. What are these challenges? African girls have decreased access to education as compared to boys. This is despite the fact that the data reveals that investing in the education of girls is one of the best, best investments a society can make. African girls are subjected to early marriage and female genital mutilation. In fact, in Africa, three girls in 10 under the age of 18 are married. Outside the home, African girls may be forced to work. And inside the home, African girls may be forced to bear a heavy burden of domestic labor. All of this because they are girls and not boys. The situation can get worse. Economics, biology, and cultural norms can intersect to disadvantage adolescent girls even further. The lack of access to sanitary products and facilities and the natural bodily function of menstruation, coupled with taboos, create a perfect storm of marginalization that robs girls of their education. On any given day, millions of African girls miss school because of a routine bodily function. They're menstruating. Not only do they lose out on their education and the ability to break the cycle of poverty, they experience the psychic costs of shame. What should be done? Today, we gather in person and online to not only have a conversation, but to create networks and identify interventions that will make a difference for the African girl child. You will hear from activists, leaders, researchers, feminists, and experts. We will discuss access to education and technology and the health and well being of African girls, but we will do more than share knowledge. We will identify strategies and forge collaborations that will sustain the progress made thus far and further advance the African girl child. So, whether you are online or in this auditorium, I invite you to join this conversation. Let's move from publication to discussion to action. Attorney General Alliance Africa has, been a, has a keen interest in the well-being of the African girl child. As mentioned, African girls face deeply entrenched discrimination and are too often the targets of crime and violence. Women and girls account for more than 70% of human trafficking victims. At AGA Africa, we strengthen the capacity of African stakeholders to address cross-border crime and achieve justice. We do so by building relationships with ministries of justice justice, as well as the private sector and NGOs to train prosecutors, attorneys, police officers, magistrates, and judges. We are a nonpartisan U.S.-based NGO, and we have country coordinators in Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Rwanda, Seychelles, Senegal, Uganda, and Zambia. In closing, I'd like to share my hopes for this conference. My first hope is that our deliberations today are productive. My second hope is that today's de deliberations help us build a tomorrow in which more African girls can realize their aspirations. Again, welcome. Come on, guys. And with that, I would like to invite up to the podium Chooks Unamba Opara. He is the program coordinator based at the Secretariat in Nairobi. Chooks.
Good morning, everyone. Um, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. The first thing I'd like to do is to um, give warm greetings from the AGA Africa um, Executive Leadership and the Executive Leadership of AGA, uh, Ms. Karen White, and from our board member, Mr. Marcus Green, who unfortunately um, could not be here today. Um, before I begin with my short remarks, I'd like to state that we're delighted by the vibrant partnership that we, we're enjoying with Good Governance Africa this year. And we look forward to many more years of cooperation and collaboration. Um, I'd also like to make a special mention of Gail, who has been extremely instrumental in putting this workshop together and coordinating all the various activities between us and the other partners and other sponsors on board. And I'd just like everyone to give her a round of applause because there's so much that's been going on in the background. <laughs> okay. Today, as we celebrate uh, the International Day of the Girl Child, I would like to applaud your endeavors towards protecting the girl child from exploitation. And if there's anyone here that doesn't think we're celebrating the, uh, the girl child, all they need to do is look at the handbags in the room. And there'd be no doubts about that. In a world where human trafficking accounts for 150 billion US dollars a year, with $99 billion attributed to sexual exploitation, of which the girl child is the most vulnerable, these efforts towards the protection of the girl child are now more important than ever. That is why, as we gather here today, let us focus our attention on the challenges that the girl child faces and the ways that we can not only protect the girls in our society and their rights, but also promote their empowerment. I think as a father of three girls, um, this, this is something that is really important uh, to me. I have a personal interest in that, as, as you can imagine, and also in the wider society as well. It is therefore our duty as stakeholders in this field to ensure that absolute girls have the right to a safe and educated, healthy life. These girls, especially as empowered uh, individuals, have the potential uh, today uh, uh, to be today and tomorrow's industry leaders, mothers, entrepreneurs, workers, mentors, household heads, and political political leaders. I think that is being increasingly reflected that where women are given the opportunity. Um, education, financial inclusion, etc., then there is a lot of success. That is evident everywhere. It is evident in this room. And uh, I'm a man, but I have to say, as Kim said, an investment in the girl child pays off, I think, a lot more in terms of looking after the wider society, most definitely. Um, as AG Africa, one of our core mandate areas is the combating of human trafficking, which uh, our efforts deeply resonate with the work that we do. One can say that this forms the basis of our, vib our vibrant partnership here today. What happens to the victims in the obscure corners of Johannesburg, on the seedy streets of Lagos, or on the shores of the Kenyan coast affects us all. Since AJ Africa's inception in 2016, we have organized 24 events on human trafficking. That is why approximately 1,000 delegates ranging from judicial officers to prosecutors to police officers have gone through our workshops. In our 10 member countries, we have partnered with numerous stakeholders from the region, including offices of the Attorney General, Ministries of Justice, Ministries of Internal Affairs, Offices of Public Prosecution, Judiciary Training Institutes, Departments of Justice, uh, Human Rights Commissions, and National Police Services, and also with civil society uh, organizations such as GGA. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with organizations whose specific mandate is to fight human trafficking. This has included uh, the Anti-Money Laundering and Trafficking of Human Beings Project, AMLTHB, uh, which, which is funded by the European Union, the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIC, the Network Against Human Trafficking, uh, the Roos Foundation, among others. Within this region, we have also enjoyed the support of African 
Prosecutors Association, and we, and we have worked with partners such as the British High Commission and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It is our goal when we enter these partnerships on trafficking to exchange information on best practices in respect to professional jurisdictions and responsibilities. So far, we have been and continue to be amazed by the impact of our program. This impact is why we continue to receive requests for collaborations in the area of, of human trafficking. During our program, we have witnessed vibrant cross-border exchanges of legal and technical knowledge through workshops. So it is, it is our hope, I think, uh, building on Kim's point, that the reason why we have people in this room from all across the continent, from South Africa, from Kenya, Zambia, um, Malawi, and so on, is for the exchange of ideas, to promote best practice, to create networks. So apart from sitting in this room, it's also about who you're speaking to while you're having coffee, uh, who you're sitting with while you're having lunch, and the outcome of these conversations that make up the greater conversation. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we, we can achieve, and we join hands in working together, fighting vices like human trafficking. I mean, I think at this point, I will just stop here, because I could go on for ages, to be honest. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, everyone in the room for being here. I'd like to thank everyone online. I can't see you, but I know you're online and you're listening. And I hope we have a wonderful day and a great workshop. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you all for that beautiful lineup. Um, I did say I like hard copies. And for those fortunate who are physically here and have the program, that's another book to keep for life. Because when we talk about networking and knowing who to follow up with after this, who to call on, this is going to stand you well. Um, I take this point to introduce a friend, an activist, an amazing woman whom I've known for many, many years, and that's where networking is great. <laughs> I met Lebohang Ramafogo when we were students at WITS, when we had no boundaries, <laughs> when there were no holy cows, <laughs> and we feared nothing. We had no dependence. All we had to do is ensure that we have eaten for the day, and the rest was history. But we also met at a time when South Africa was going through a very serious transformation period. And that was post 90 with the release of our political prisoners and a clear path that showed us all that we are moving towards a democratic state. So it was a very exciting time. And I'm very pleased to have had Lebo as one of the people I knew then and have seen her in her career and her life maintain a very same energy and focus on fighting inequality and raising the flag for justice for all. She has been an instrument of many changes in this country, in this continent, and even globally, where she has forced leaders of serious esteem to stop and rethink their own actions and to even have introspections on their own personal lives because Lebo doesn't have any holy cows. She lives the values that she preaches. If she is for equality for all, she will preach it from the smallest of a person to the highest of a person that society accords status to. But she herself attempts, like any human being, to even keep that balance in her own life. So I'm really proud today to introduce Lebo, who her full bio is with you on the program, who's a passionate activist. She's currently the director of Oxfam South Africa. She recently took up that reign and she's been doing amazing. If the word brave can summarize Lebo, she's the most brave woman I've ever met. She is not scared. She is not scared to face a huge mountain, but she's not also scared to say, I need help because she's human. And I think through her, a lot of us can learn a lot, but also appreciate that this kind of work that we all do requires a space where we can also have empathy for those who show bravery 
and for those who lead us. So today we have Lebo in our midst to give us an opening address that I hope will stimulate us all and close that little gap in us of anxiety, of doubt. You know, this patriarchal space is always difficult to navigate. Some of us sometimes miss a step and you wonder if the world has seen you and you're like, is this a patriarchally correct thing to do or not? So I wish to introduce Lebo, but before I do that, um, I've received messages on my phone from some people in the room and outside the room pointing me to a huge mistake I've made. I didn't realize it's a mistake because I've tended to love and know people to such a sisterly level that I forget their official roles. <laughs> and I just want to bring to our midst the fact that we are so well supported today that our Deputy Minister of Social Development is amongst us. But she's amongst us also as an activist who cares about girls' issues. And that's why she's on a panel and she's going to impart her own knowledge and participate as one of us. So thank you, ma'am, for joining us as a sister and also as a Deputy Minister. You're welcome. Lebo Khangra Mafuko, over to you. Thank you, Linda, for that warm introduction. Indeed, we were young, gifted, and black um, in the 90s. And uh, it is for that reason that even as I was uh, preparing yesterday, I, was, I felt so many emotions because when we were young, um, in our early, late teens and early 20s, the promise of a new South Africa for us felt like we will not be sitting here in 2022 still discussing the issues that are faced by girl children. Uh, so, Honourable Deputy Minister, all the organisers, esteemed speakers who will be in various panels today, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I am mumbling on because I do have slides that I'm waiting to come uh, on the screen. Uh, very soon I'll be singing if they don't come on board. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you very much. Can, can I also see them on the screen so that I don't... Um, um you know turn around um and, and 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 see but it's not a bad angle so i can i titled um the talk that i'm going to give today the systemic betrayal of the girl child because for me it is not a coincidence that even at, at on a day pronounced to be the day of the girl child we are still talking not about the many, many achievements that girl child um, um, acquire, but we are talking about the challenges that girl children acquire. And I spoke about it as a betrayal because all of us sitting here are complicit in what is the situation of girl children today. And it is systemic and not individual. I also speak um, about the issues facing um, uh, girl children uh, from an intersectional lens. And I really want to thank the organizers for focusing on the girl child because issues affecting the girl child are intertwined with issues affecting women. And what has happened in society right now is that there is often and always a focus on issues affecting uh, 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 women, young women, to the exclusion of issues affecting um, um, uh, the girl child. And for me, intersectionality is a way of understanding the multiple overlapping oppressions affecting women and their effects on the girl child. You cannot continue with the oppression of women and not see the impact that that has on the girl child. And these, just um, a few, are economic systems. And it is so interesting that we are speaking at the uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange. The economic systems that systematically exclude women, especially black women. 
We cannot continue to pretend as if capitalism and racial capitalism is going to take us from the situation that we are in. And unless we are prepared to question the way in which the world has structured the economy and who it has included and who it has excluded and treated as this holy cow, we are not going to pay, to pay justice to the issues affecting girl children. And we have seen the growing inequality globally that was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Ask yourself today, who became a billionaire due to the COVID-19 pandemic? And who right now does not know where their next meal is going to come from as a result of COVID-19? And go figure whether or not we have created a global economic system that is going to get us out of trouble or bury us even deeper into the trouble that we have. But of course, the other issue that we need to pay attention to is the, the gendered nature of care work. Various studies show that even when men and women are unemployed, the burden of care work, unpaid care work, falls on the shoulders of women. According to data provided by ILO, or ILO women perform three quarters of unpaid care work, or 76% of the total of hours provided. We would all know what this means, particularly for girl children. And all of this will not be taking place. We would not be in this room talking about these issues if there wasn't patriarchy and the gender norms that are, that, that, that are formed by, by patriarchy. Next slide. So we see that the burden of care, of housework, and the care for others falls disproportionately on the girl child. For an example, cooking in rural areas, even before girl children go to school, they must first uh, go and, 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 and fetch water. Often in areas like KwaZulu-Natal, facing violence and the abuse by young boys and men who wait for them as they go and fetch water. And you know, this morning as I was, you know, going through these slides and I was thinking, I was like, you know, if there is one thing you can grant patriarchy, it's its cleverness, ne? Because where it benefits men, we are told about their strength, but they are not the people fetching water, you know, because I myself did my primary education um, at, um, uh, in a rural uh, area where my aunt used to teach. It is hard work balancing that bucket of water on your head. And yet when it comes to that kind of unpaid work, men are not displaying their strength. It is only when they keep women in control that they remind you of their strength, but not when they've got to fetch water. I was like, you, I, I'm not too sure. Keep that slide on. <laughs> but what we have seen around this gendered nature of care work is that for many young girls, and I think uh, the previous speaker spoke about, is that care work takes precedence over academics. If there is any choice, somebody is sick, we saw it, um, in the in the in the uh, uh, HIV pandemic, when somebody is sick, when there is shortage of, of 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 money, and somebody has to do that labor, it is the girl child who will be required to either do the work uh, before they go to school or after um, school, or basically uh, uh, drop out of school to do um, the care work. When I was at Soul City, we did um, many, many amazing programs. But one of them was the Rise Talk Show when we interviewed or we invited young women to come and participate uh, in some shows. And I remember one young woman who was studying social work who said, and I'm paraphrasing, when I am in the lecture hall, around three o'clock, I stop concentrating because I am thinking of my eight-year-old sibling who is being looked after by my 12-year-old sibling and whether or not they have not made a fire and they have locked the door. Because when I get home, I don't know what I will find. That and many other work that I have done with young women not only makes me 
but it makes me very, very angry. Nope, remain with that slide. Um, so what we also see, uh, which I think it is where you cannot divorce what we are talking about from patriarchy, is that the abuse of the girl child becomes a cultural rite of passage into womanhood. How many of you would be sleeping? I remember my own uh, upbringing where you would be sleeping at seven o'clock and my mother would come in into the room and say, hey, tzoha, tzoha, wake up, wake up. Who's going to marry a girl who's still sleeping at seven o'clock because I must go and fray for stoop. Uh, I don't know what is fray for stoop. Okay, polish a stoop. Stoop is posh just to make sure that everybody uh, is, is in the room. So it becomes a rite of passage for us as women to perform all of these tasks. It's no longer an issue of this is a gender norm and also a gender norm that is oppressive. It also becomes what you then grow up to aspire to. I better know how to cook. I better know how to fray for stoop properly. I better know how to wash. I better know how to do these tasks. And so you can see how this systemic oppression of women becomes something that women themselves start aspiring to and judging each other against. You know, um, um, I cook now because I cook for myself. But in the past, I would say to people, I don't cook in my house. And they would say, oh my God, who does this task? I say, well, I work at Soul City. So you either make me work at Soul City or work in the home. I don't do both because that's not what I do. But the kind of normalization of this abuse means that as a woman, over and above, even at a time when women are leaving the home and they are working, whether they are domestic workers or they are selling fruits at the, at the corner of the street or they are executives even at the JSE, this form of labor is still expected from women to prove their womanhood. Next slide. But what also happens is that young women's sexuality needs either get ignored, pathologized, or moralized. Even right now, when we talk about young women's sex, it is from a level of disease. When we talk about it, it's in the context of pregnancy. It is in the context of HIV. It is not from pleasure. It is not saying to women, you will have sex and it is pleasurable. And please have sex with a man who knows what to do or with a woman, whoever you choose, go after pleasure. We don't talk about pleasure, but about disease. And so normal growth is clouded in myths, various myths about menstruation, various myths even in religion about what you can touch, what you can eat, what you cannot eat, what you can do, what you cannot do when you menstruate. But also what has happened is that there is amazing levels that will make it a pandemic of violence against women uh, 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 and girls, which apart from like what we saw um, uh, yesterday with the decomposed bodies of young women found in Johannesburg who were sex workers. And I guess because they were sex workers, nobody was looking for them um, until those bodies were found. The violence that women experience uh, is also about policing their bodies and their sexual expression. So when there is rape, when a woman is raped, the first thing that comes is what were they what were they uh, 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 wearing? I was sharing um, a few days ago. In fact, I was preceded by Deputy Minister at a conference on sexual and um, reproductive justice that the Department of DSD um, uh, organized that all of us are so conscious of this violence that we perform patriarchy. So whenever I arrive at a building, I make it a point that I'm extra nice and I smile wider for the security guard. Because regardless of who you are, when you confront a man, regardless of who they are, your status means nothing. Because in fact, you do know that you must say, hello, Baba, how are you? You know, because you need to come across as this woman that respects men. And you know, and what about a woman who's accessing a clinic somewhere where in fact they can be turned away by the security guard at the gate simply because he can. And how many of us have had to pass 
even traffic cops before you give them a, a your cell phone number just so that you are safe in the middle of the night. That is how our lives are being policed. And of course, we've got a, pro a, a problem of statutory rape. Uh, next slide. Um, which basically, uh, in South Africa, we have termed the euphemism of teenage pregnancy. There is no teenage pregnancy. There are men sleeping with children. And it's statutory rape, period. It ends there. And until if you until you call it what it is, it will basically continue because teenage pregnancy puts the onus of blame on the teenager and not on the man who is normally older than the woman to take responsibility because we are all patriarchal princes and princesses and we all su uh, support uh, the system. But somebody who sums it up very, very well for me is Professor Pumla Kola who wrote the book, The Female Fear Factory. And if I, you ask me, what are some of the practical solutions in basically looking at the struggle of the girl child for health, education, and agency, is make it a must for everybody. In the JSE, if you are going to be celebrating Christmas, please give every official the Female Fear Factory. Everybody who is interested in understanding issues that are faced by women, Please read this book because the book, uh, Female Fear Factory, Gender and Patriarchy Under Racial Capitalism by Pumla Gola, it's, it has a lot of gems and it has examples from across the world. But what it does, it shows us that violence and control of women because of this machination of fear that we want women to grow up in, it basically makes it normal. And therefore, it is expected that girl children should experience these various injustices. What it does is that even before society uh, uh, discriminates against girl children and women, is that the women and the girl children themselves from a very, very uh, early age self-stigmatize. Because we all know of the definition of who is a good girl and how they acquire that status. When I was younger, people would say, oh, but you, you speak too much for a girl. Oh, you are too loud. Nobody said, you know what, one day you'll be 51, you'll be at the JSE and telling people whatever it is that you want to say. Nobody said that. It wasn't positive. And it wasn't positive because it wasn't a positive thing on its own. It wasn't positive because I was a girl. So that self-blame and self-stigma where you've got to to you know to anchor you know to 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 censure yourself i know even in my personal life you know uh, somebody will cheat at me and things will happen and people will say oh but poor guy and I'm like, why is i a poor guy i'm the one that was left hanging drives that oh but label you 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 never look desperate you know so the idea that you really need to tame yourself and how many girl children are socialized by women, by grandmothers, by teachers, by schools, to be in a particular way of self censure. Next slide. So what then happens is that even when injustice happens to the girl child, like rape, the girl child is not believed, resulting in self-blame. We were having um, um, a discussion the other day about how even some judges will basically... Uh, excuse a man who has raped a child because they say, well, the family has met, he has apologized, he's given them a cow, and it's okay. It happens in many societies. And so what happens is that society, so there is systemic exclusion. It then becomes okay to exclude young women. But also, society gets away with systemic exclusion and the lack of provision of services. We get away with it because, in fact, young women and girls do not deserve some of these services. So if we are really serious about, you know, the business that we are on uh, today is that the focus on the girl child must be our opportunity to reflect on our complicity as a society to uphold violent systems that oppress women from birth and how we have benefited from them. Because we have benefited. I often say I would not be who I am if a woman from Putadichaba 
had not left her 11 year old to come and look after my 11 year old and three weeks old baby now. Right now, my daughter is an executive. She lives in Oslo. Matabiso's daughter is a domestic worker. So I'm not speaking about benefiting from the exclusion of women from a position where I am saying I am better than others. We all know how we are complicit and how the systemic injustices of certain sectors of the society benefits all of us, myself as a feminist, as a gender activist included. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning. I, I think after everything that you've said, I'm sure many of us are reflecting and many of us are thinking about the most powerful things that you've said. But before I reflect on some of the things that you've said, maybe let me take the opportunity to officially introduce myself. My name is Saram Tinto. I'm the head of Telcom Foundation and we're a partner in this conversation. And Deputy Minister, very thankful to have you in our midst. As you were speaking, Mamlebo, you triggered quite a couple of things. <clears throat> Sorry. Am I audible? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I am. Um, my responsibility is really to. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. My responsibility is really to moderate a panel. But before I do so, I just wanted to share some reflections triggered by what you were saying as you were speaking here. So as the Telcom Foundation, we, we work in various communities. And our biggest interest in these communities is education. And because we're a tech company, we invest a lot in technology to improve the quality of education. But of course, technology is just one of the many things that you can do. We, in my view, and the way that we've configured our work, we have been quite deliberate around understanding what it means to work with children in marginalized communities. And firstly, we recognize that computers on their own don't solve the problems that our young girls are facing. We have a very comprehensive strategy that deals with, in a very holistic manner, challenges that we face in education. We, we have a, a number of social workers placed in schools where we support. We do a lot of teacher development. We work with principals. We work with um, children in terms of academic support. But importantly, we are very deliberate in making sure that even in our selection of participants in our program, we skew our focus to girl children, precisely because of the issues that you have raised. And as you were speaking, I was actually thinking about some of the real challenges that we've observed on the ground. And I think most of them were exacerbated by COVID. So let me start um, with what we saw perhaps during the COVID space. Of course, we deployed technology. We understood that children were under lockdown restrictions. They couldn't access education. And we then enabled them to learn remotely. And one of the glaring experiences we had was when we were doing this online that was relatively new for many of our learners, we actually picked up a dynamic that really speaks to what you were saying. So in a household where you have a boy child and a girl child learning, very often you will have a girl child coming very late to the online class because a girl child has to do domestic chores. And even when a girl child is in that online classroom, when there is a child crying in the background, they would not do it to a boy child. So that kind of 
um, dynamic we realized has had a very serious bearing just in the way that our children were experiencing. And I don't want to speak a lot because we've got in our panel one of our program managers in the Telcom Foundation who will also share. I think as you were speaking, I also got triggered because at a personal level and as a woman who is in corporate, I've also had to reflect on the dynamics of being a woman in a corporate space. Because I'm sure you know, as a woman, not only do you deal with the challenges of being in a corporate space, you actually have to prove yourself twice as much as your male counterparts. When you walk into the boardroom, people look at you and actually they question whether you should actually be sitting around that table. And unfortunately for many of us, the experience has been that it is not always men that actually challenge. It's also other women that actually pull you down. We don't have it in ourselves to actually carry and support each other. We actually are the ones that believe that I should be the only one that sits around that table. We don't make it our responsibility to carry other women and have them in the boardroom in the same way as we are. And I reflect also in, in my personal situation, in my personal life, and I think to myself, you know, when you talk about systemic oppression, it is so deep that even in our families, we're not conscious. But when we think about naming our children, you have a palisa in the family and you've got a mantra in the family. And that by itself, and palisa re really, for those who might not understand, it, really is a flower, mantra is power. Already in naming in that way, you already are talking about dynamics. Because a woman is supposed to be sitting there and be very pretty and be a flower. But a man or a boy must actually resemble power. You know, Mandla must be someone that carries a lot of power, carries a lot of force. And I think we're not conscious very often when we think about how we ourselves contribute to really entrenching this systemic oppression that we speak about. And I just wanted to one last refre reflection. I remember when, and this was 19 years ago, when I was... Um, getting married and i'm very fortunate to be married into a family that is very supportive of gender equality i come from a family that obviously supports patriarchy and i'm not i mean i don't think it's the right thing to do but that's how i learned i learned my role from when i was very little but i had to unlearn a lot of the things that i learned when i was young i remember very well when i was you know in african tradition there's this thing that on a particular day as part of the celebration they go and they um offer you to the family that you are marrying into and so they are going to give you over to that family and i remember vividly uh, my mother and my aunts sitting me down and telling me about how i should behave when i get into that family and how i should be very strong because men and I don't know how to translate it in English, but uh, 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 simply put, I was told that a man is almost um, resembles what you see in a cabbage. They, they can spread themselves wild and you must resemble yourself to a pumpkin, right? So you must hold yourself together. So in other words, a man can go around and do as much as they can. And I need to understand, but I need to hold myself together so that I, I don't disappoint them as my family. And we walked the journey and I was given a broom. Uh, obviously, when you, you are wearing this traditional attire, you are being received by this family and you are wearing this um, and you are being given a broom, which is symbolic of the role that you must take in that family. Uh, that broom, my family uh, were actually trying to communicate a message to me to say, when you walk into that family, do not disappoint us. You have been given this broom so that you can play that role that you are expected to play. Fortunately for me, my mother-in-law asked them to take back the broom as we are approaching the gate. And I'm very, very happy for her to have done that. So without wasting any time, let me allow my panelists uh, to come to the floor, uh, to the fore, 
and I'll introduce them as they come up. Our topic for this particular panel is really focused on education and technology. Uh, Tony Ramatsui is a project manager, or program manager, a very young, brilliant uh, woman who works in telecom. And I have the privilege to have worked with Tony for, for many, many years. She refers to herself as a millennial generalist and a quintessential me millennial. I don't know what that means, but she will tell us what, um, what that means. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Rachel Sibande. I'm hoping she is here. <laughs> Dr. Rachel Sibande is a senior director who's uh, with the United Nations Foundation. I think she's been mic'd. And she comes from a beautiful country, Malawi, and she will be speaking about her experiences and the work that she has been doing in that beautiful country of ours. She refers to herself as an entrepreneur, a Google scholar, and many other things. I'll, I'll allow you to speak to the work that um, you have been doing in that beautiful country called Malawi. Our last panelist, uh, Ms. Busisi Wesiobi, who works for the Good Governance Africa Institution. She's a lead researcher in that particular organization. She has worked in multiple sectors. I think you hold an MPhil in public policy and administration from UCT, and you will be joining us in this conversation. So maybe let me sit here. So as I said, our particular focus for this conversation is really around education and technology with a particular focus on the girl child. And maybe, Tony, let me start with you. You refer to yourself as a millennial generalist or millennial quintessential. Maybe explain to us what that means in the context of what we're discussing today. Thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon or morning to all of our esteemed guests, as well as the Deputy Minister, Deputy Minister mm. uh, at large and those joining um, us online. My name is Tony Tandi Nkosi Ramatsui, as uh, so formally introduced by Sarah, and I've really branded myself as a millennial generalist. Why have I taken this approach? Of course, I'm a millennial, which means I was born in the 90s. And most interestingly to point out is that I was really born at a time in which technology has really changed in which all human beings across all LSMs or income brackets has changed our lives. I mean, I can, from my earliest memory in grade one, having access to uh, the first Macintosh uh, computers. I'm not sure the very colorful ones with the dial-up tone and doing my grade one projects on that, to starting my high school journey um, with the introduction of our first social media apps in their primacy stages being MySpace. I was one of the first earliest adopters, um, I can admit, as well as mix it to the proliferation thereof as we see TikTok and Facebook becoming one of the largest companies in the world. Generalist um, is the second portion to my brand, being that I do feel like the field of specialization is slowly, slowly dying away with the advent of AI and technology. We're seeing that in 2050, it was predicted the point of singularity, which is with which the intelligence of computers will surpass the sum of all human intelligence combined. Very, very scary thought. But we're seeing more and more encouragements that we go and venture out into new careers, new spaces, try what works for you. Um, really changing the culture of the fear of failure. Um, the failure or true failures in not trying um, and not discovering who you are. So in a nutshell, millennial journalist. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe whilst you on that and just how powerful technology has been, maybe let me, let me take a step back and just ask, in your opinion, why do you think we should be focusing on educating a girl child in the context of what you were saying about yeah oh sorry so if i can uh, answer this by sharing a personal story um i was very fortunate of getting married last year april i took the decision uh, <laughs> to join the traditionalists if you may have it um and what really is shocking is that um my tutoring or 
um, coming to womanhood speech done by my mother amongst other older ladies in my family and people that I've genuinely looked up to did not very much um, from what Sarah outlined with her mother-in-law and there's about a 20 years age gap difference between the <laughs> two of us right mm. so education truly and speaking um, in the journey I guess of my parents aspiring to be educated uh, my father studied abroad obtaining his PhD in marriage and family therapy I then was a product um, and I did not see the abject poverty that my cousins, not very different in age to me, experience today and do not sit on this platform as with me today. So education mm. truly, truly is the lever upon which we can um, effect change in society. Mm. And Dr. Rachel, I hope you don't mind me calling you Dr. Rachel. You have done such sterling work in Malawi. I mean, you set up the first and the very first tech hub in Malawi, I read somewhere that you're currently busy training over, is it 60,000 young people in future skills? Can we just give you an opportunity to just briefly share with our audience what work you do in Malawi in re with regards to promoting young, young girls and women and what impact have you seen? Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. So, I mean, like she mentioned, growing up as a young girl, I was very curious and I fell in love with computers at the age of 11. And I knew that I wanted to become something different. I wanted to become an ethical hacker. Not that I'm going to hack. <laughs> You're safe. Not that I'm going to hack into your phones today. Mm. Um, <laughs> but suffice it to say that it was a very lonely journey. Mm. Um, I did not have any mentors no women to look up to in mm. my country, in my community that had made it within the technology domain. Mm. It's a very uh, thin space for women. Mm. I'm sure my colleagues would agree. Uh, it remains thinner even globally. Right mm. now I've translated into the uh, space of big data and artificial intelligence, and mm. it's very few women mm. uh, in that space. And that's what motivated me to set up the Girls Coding Club and the Technology Hub in Malawi mm. to make it different for the other young girls to bring the ladder down mm. so that other young girls can climb and also get to where I am and in fact do better than I have. Mm. And so because of that, uh, the technology hub trains young girls uh, with digital skills to prepare them for jobs of the future mm. because in future jobs are going to be different. We're going to have social media anthropologists. We're already seeing the advent of data scientists. Mm -hmm. We're going to have virtual reality engineers, artificial intelligence experts, online imaging experts, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so it's to prepare them for jobs of the future. Mm -hmm. And so we've set up a girls coding club where we train girls how to develop technology mm -hmm. solutions, how to develop mobile applications, web applications, robotics. And in terms of some of what we've seen to your question, very heartwarming stories. For example, I'm not a robotics engineer myself, but I set up a robotics club mm. where girls have been trained how to build robots. Some of the robots they've built mm. are bringing solutions to social problems. For mm. example, there's a robot that um, a group of young girls built, which enhances access to safe and clean water. Mm. As you know, a lot of the cases we have in our hospitals are people who are there because they haven't had access to clean water. Mm. And so this robot separates dirty water from clean water. Mm. And uh, with that initiative, they actually won a global competition, mm. went on a plane for the first time in their lives to the United States of America mm. and competed at a global scale at a global robotics competition. Mm. I've never built a robot in my life. In as much as you'd think I'm smart in tech, but these are skills that even I do not have. And it warms my heart to see that we are building a generation of young girls who are going to transcend into the future of jobs. I think last example into the, some of the impact we're seeing is even with young uh, children. Mm. We've also set up a children's coding club where we train children how to code. Because I imagine if I had started to code or if I was introduced to computers earlier than I was, man, maybe I would have been <laughs> a, a superstar. Mm. And so one of the examples is a young child who we trained how to code at age eight. He built a technology solution that enhances learning mm. because it converts speech to text and teaches children how to talk early enough. You know, when he built this solution, um, for us, it was a small thing out of, you know, Malawi. But Mark Zuckerberg noticed that invited the young boy to the Facebook effort conference. Next day, he posted on his Facebook page saying he wishes 
Zuckerberg. Mm. He'd started coding earlier than this eight-year-old Malawian child. Mm. And the next day, the hub was flooded with parents mm. bringing their children for mm. them to also learn how to code. Mm. So these are some of the stories that mm. warm my heart in believing that there's a future and an opportunity for us to build young children and young women that can become ready for the future of what jobs will look like. Mm. That's quite exciting and quite interesting. And maybe, Busi, let me ask you, you have worked in various industries. I mean, you do a lot of research. What, in your view, is actually constraining us from ensuring that not just the few girls that she's referring to, but at a wider scale, we are able to make sure that every girl child has the opportunity to become what she has just explained mm -hmm. now. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Honorable Deputy Minister, good to have you with us. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm Musi COB, lead researcher in the Natural Resource Governance Program at, at GGA. Uh, Sarah, before I, I dive into that, I want to just share some introductory remarks and how I was reflecting and thinking of this day as we reflect and observe mm -hmm. uh, International Day of the Girl Child. And it is only fitting, of course, um, that we take stock and, and unpack some of the key challenges and successes mm. uh, faced by the girl child on our, on our continent. Um, one of the key areas, of course, being access to quality education mm. um, and technology mm. for the betterment of our future. And to, to touch on your point then, Sarah, because, I mean, tech is one of the many industries that mm. girl children are showing interest in and can also participate in. But I think most importantly is making sure that there is exposure from a young age and understanding the strengths and weaknesses mm. of our girl children is very important for as parents, as, as teachers, mm. um, as educators, and even professionals and executives in the various industries to expose them to the mm. different variety of potential careers that in that way we will be able to, to build better futures for, for the girl child. Mm. Mm. Quite interesting. I mean, Tony, you work a lot with young, young girls in various marginalized communities. I think one of the things I have constantly heard from the work that we do in the foundation is just how hard it is for girl children to be encouraged to take subjects like maths and science. Mm -hmm. If we talk about careers of the future, I mean, these are some of the basic foundational subjects that we need to be looking at. What are some of the challenges that are making it hard for us as parents, for us as teachers, to believe that girl children can actually excel in these subjects? Sure. Fundamentally, and I think I would launch off with a quote to say that traditionally one may believe that, you know, the limits of our potential are defined by our geographic areas, our upbringing. However, truly speaking, our limits are defined by the breadth of our imagination and how big we can dream. And what we found, and perhaps an example, was in one of our coding programs where we went into a school in Twane West, uh, Soshan Guve Winterfeld, a uh, very, very um, impoverished areas, uh, very quite close in proximity to urban areas. So they're exposed to what success and uh, privilege looks like. Uh, when asked, you know, who thinks in the room can code, you know, raise of hands, majority boys. Um, however, we were intent that we will assess everyone on basic computer literacy skills, as well as design thinking. I think an important uh, aspect within coding is how do you think to solve problems? Mm -hmm. And what we found is in the test, the results spoke for themselves to say a majority of women actually excelled in that testing. Mm -hmm. So what we found is that, you know, girls and I guess a number of issues, but lack of representation that I can actually do this, therefore I can dream to achieve it, mm -hmm. is what then we almost self-sabotage ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And the process or the journey of eventually obtaining that. And we find it in uh, STEM subjects. Mm -hmm. We went out into these communities with a diagnostic, a mathematical diagnostic, which assessed grade nine learners at a grade three, six, and nine level. Shockingly, we found that 60% of everyone that completed the diagnostic ranked at a grade four to grade seven level. So we found that within our educational system, we seem to be losing a lot of learners in that intermediate phase of learning. Therefore, when it comes to grade nine and it's your chance to pick subjects, you don't feel confident within yourself that I can excel mm -hmm. in STEM related uh, subject. 
So it really is, you know, bigger than ourselves here sitting in the room, but in our individuality, um, inputting into that system so that from ECD, as earlier on, as she said, you know, if the earlier you introduce um, the tying in or the linkage between what I'm studying, Pythagoras and math, mm -hmm. to actually coding a robot mm -hmm. and showing that so that it will be economically viable as well. Mm -hmm. um, is what we'll see will really spur um, and encourage more females to take up, uh, STEM subjects. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rachel, your views on the same question, maths and science, and maybe share with us what you are seeing in Malawi. Is it similar to what we are seeing in South Africa? Is it similar to what we're seeing in Togo? What are some of the areas that you believe your country is doing very well in respect of pushing young girls to pursue maths and science as uh, potential subjects that relate to what you were saying are careers of the future? Yeah. So I think um, like the picture that she painted is no different from what we're seeing in Malawi. Uh, but just to add to that, I think the social norms as well, mm. just, you know, they say charity begins at home. Home is where everything starts. And so what we are told at home as young girls growing up, for example, I come from a family where my father is a professional accountant. My mother was a trained teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but they, at the time as I was growing up, believed that, you know, I would succeed in everything and anything. Mm -hmm. I was not graded or looked at to say I'm excused from not doing well in maths or science subjects. I was held as accountable in doing well in maths and science subjects as much as in any other subjects. And that really helped me because then I realized that there's no excuse. Mm. But elsewhere you find that, um, you know, in the home or in the families, in the communities, it's almost like as if because you're a girl, you are excused. It's okay not to do too well in maths. Mm. It's fine. So that stereotyping around, you know, what, how girls should perform in certain subjects like STEM subjects and giving them that excuse kind of reinforces the, 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 the belief that she was talking about, which they grow up with and think, well, I'm okay. I don't have to, to, to venture into these subjects. I think the other thing that I've seen and also from personal experience is now the lack of, you know, other initiatives that can support girls to mm. do well and to excel in STEM. Mm. But we're seeing the invention of um, mathematics Olympiads, for example, um, coding programs for girls and young people, hackathons, which are enhancing those informal skills, but even through the formal curricula for girls to do well in STEM subjects. I think finally, I would also say that it's a very lonely space mm. for girls. Um, personally, when I went to my undergrad, there were initially 14 of us mm. in our first year program, as compared to maybe 30 plus boys in the Bachelor of Science program. But when we went into specializing, only five girls specialized in computer science. And uh, when I went for my master's program, it was only two girls mm. out of a class of 20 plus. Mm. When I went for a PhD, I was the only woman mm. in the computer science PhD program that year at mm. Rhodes University and also only black. Sure, guys. So, <laughs> so it becomes very thin. It mm. becomes very lonely. And there is more of also building the resilience that mm -hmm. we need to do uh, to women that get into these spaces to hold the fort mm -hmm. and to keep going mm -hmm. and to keep sending that ladder down to bring more up. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there is hope when you see people like ourselves here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is hope. And we need to then bring ourselves closer to the girls in the communities mm -hmm. to make them believe that I was just like you, but I am here and that you too can do it. Mm. And that makes me wonder whether there is a conversation to be had around how government should use its legislative power mm. to, I mean, we heard Mamelebu saying a lot of these things that we're discussing here are very systematic. Mm. In your view, um, Sispusi, what do you think governments in the continent should be doing to really try and promote medicine science, particularly around um, girl children? Thank you for the question, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I think medicine science, as you all know, are very critical subjects. Mm -hmm. And outside of, of that, there are also important career paths outside of medicine science that mm -hmm. should also be 
promoted and advocated for. Mm. Um, with the Africa Girl Child publication, I particularly focused on child labor mm. as one of the key challenges that the girl child faces. Usually, in most cases, they are underreported mm. cases of girl children participating mm. and engaging mm. in, in child labor across the continent, mm. specifically within the extractives industry, uh, which is what I specialize in and not mm. necessarily tech mm. and science, where you find that a lot of kids, and I think Mam Lebohang mentioned it, the triple burden of, of school work, mm. um, and then these hidden forms of labor as mm. well, constituting of cooking, taking care of uh, children, siblings at home. And then by the time you are participating and you know wanting to ensure that you are studying there's no capacity for that because mm. you have this triple burden of work which is prioritized in many mm. african homes so to your point again around what governments can do and also within the science and tech space mm. one is to first of all conduct the necessary research mm. in these areas for instance like child labor um, in extractives industry specifically, uh, where you need to understand that it is one underreported, mm. and two more research needs to be done and engagement with communities, and again educational campaigns that may help communities to understand the disadvantages and the barriers mm. of having kids performing in child labour roles and what that can affect their education. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, there needs to be political will from our governments mm -hmm. to ensure that there's enough capacity in terms of research mm -hmm. and, and development and also be able to look into other career forms that girl children can participate in. Thank you. Can I just check if there are any questions to the panel uh, from the floor before I pose my next question. Is there a burning question on the floor that anyone wants to ask to any one of these panelists? Sir? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm trying to follow. Hmm. Uh, I normally speak uh, kicking a suit to so I hope uh, I'm not trying to be offensive to other speakers of other languages, but my English is not very good, so I normally hoi mm. uh, there is There seems to be this emphasis from members of the panel mm. on uh, women or girl children acquiring sophisticated digi digital technology skills mm. so that there is that emphasis and that is necessary mm. that has to be done mm. I, I seem to be uncomfortable with it because uh, one is that I don't want to bore you with the whole uh, conspiracy theory kind of an approach but my question becomes is it possible to be a woman mm not technologically sophisticated and thrive. Personal example, my grandmother never came to Haute. Mm. She never used a cell phone or a computer. Mm. She lived above the age of 100. Mm. She was not poor. Mm. So I'm asking, I have children, some girl children, are we not really pushing too far on this issue of technology. I'm happy when I see a girl child in, in rural areas uh, picking up a laptop and doing or a cell phone and doing things, but I get equally uncomfortable when there is that push on digital technology, do it if you're not, you're going to sink, you're not going to be educated, you'll be poor, <laughs> you'll be black, you'll be this and this and this. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to take the second question and then i'll and the third question then i'll come back to the panel um maybe let me take you and then the lady over there then we go back to the panel Bem? morning ladies and a great thank you for the insights that you're showing my name is andile Dube and i'm from unicef um i you know when we reflect on the issues around girls and access and ict 
We often talk about the supply side. So we want them to do maths. We want them to be encouraged. We want to them to be excited about um, technology and digital skills and the skills of the future and all that. Um, but I think what we have not done enough is to deal with the issues of the demand side. So um, if you can, if the panelists can just share with us their perspective around how do we prepare employers uh, for the world where girls should get access. Because we've, in education, we're, do, we're doing almost enough. We've got all of this program, but we know that in employment, largely men still remain the highest percentage of people in those positions. So your experiences and how we share this and how we change paradigm and how we deal with those men who are actually the gate closers and openers in in those environments to really prepare for the girls who are about to be pushing the boundaries. Thank you very much. Um, Good morning. Mm -hmm. I am Simpiwe and um, my concern, right, and I, I strongly believe in supporting and uplifting the girl child. And mm. this comes from a person who was educated in a girl's school mm. and was, I grew up in the take a girl child to, uh, to work day era. So there was a lot of emphasis on girl children and I, I was a beneficiary of that. But I worry that there's an overemphasis on girl children, not enough on boy children, because who then become our husbands, our business partners, mm -hmm. our friends, the people that we interact with, because we ourselves as girls in our spaces, we're safe and we're very much unproblematic. But then the world out there, it's not necessarily cushioning, <laughs> you know, and it's not as safe. And I, I, I worry about the separate development and the overemphasis on females. Thank you. Um, I'll take another round of questions, but let me perhaps get back to the panel. I mean, there are three questions that are being asked here. Perhaps the first to reflect on is this overemphasis on technology. Your thoughts? Um, I was privy to a similar conference uh, where Professor Maralwa, uh, the Chancellor of UJ, um, was hosting. And he painted a very lovely story of his mother, um, quite elderly lady, but she was skilled in crafting of African pots. And he says his earliest memories as a child was going to the river, seeing his mother, you know, amass the materials required to make the pots, lay it out in the sun for it to bake, take it in to mold it into its crafty design, take it back outside to bake even further, and then finally uh, put it up for sale. Um, or decoration in the home. And he said that from that process as a child, what he failed to acknowledge in his mother was the engineering behind her craft. And so often as Africans, because perhaps in our vernacular languages, we don't have the terms as fancy as data science or engineering, we find that women are currently doing these things. Um, you know, in material uh, selection um, to actual manufacturing, these are things that, you know, formerly we go to the Harvards of the world mm -hmm. to find the best practices, where here's an African lady doing it in her village and is the best at doing just that. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to emphasize not just the traditional trajectory of learning. We find that even in our environments, the dropout rate is just insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Many kids exiting school at a grade nine level automatically disqualifying them to any tertiary or let's say formal tertiary um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So what we really need to inculcate in South Africans and Africans at large is the concept of lifelong learning. Um, the idea of I don't know the answer should actually be a trigger to find out and not a point of which you stop and say, okay, I'm not qualified uh, to do this job. Mm -hmm. So it's really in the pedagogy and in how we think of acquiring new information and instilling that to upskill our daily day-to-day lives. Mm. Thank you, Tony. 
Your thoughts around overemphasis of technology? Yes, um, good point he raises. And I just wanted to intimate that um, when we train these young girls, um, our approach is not to turn each one of them into purely te technical digital experts. Um, it's about helping them to be relevant in the fourth industrial revolution that we live in because we are in a global you know, smart uh, IOTs placed in the soil, mm -hmm. which automatically measure the moisture or decide then whether the plants should be watered or not. Or they should be an agricultural crop scientist who can then know how to use a mobile app to simply take a picture of a cassava crop and be able to, for, for that app to tell them what disease it is and how they can remedy it. They are not a technically digi gi digital expert, but they just understand how to apply technology. Mm -hmm. They could be a medical doctor, they could be a marketer, but they need to understand how they can use digital media mm -hmm. to reach out to the people that they are marketing to. So the approach is not to make everybody become a very technical AI expert or data scientist, but just being relevant in understanding how technology can support there are other traditional um, subject matters that they major in. Mm. Thank you. And maybe, Busi, let me ask you a question that was asked about the demand side of things. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you caught the question. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to reflect, how do we make sure that those that are meant to employ actually are ready to receive mm -hmm. and to enable are girl learners in the way that they should. Mm, thank you. And thank you for the question. I, I want to start off by saying for corporates, it's mm. very important for them to realize the role that they can play in our education system, mm. in bettering it and improving it. Mm. And I know, um, Sarah, the work that you do within the Telcom Foundation does exactly that, mm. supporting uh, education, improving education through technology. Mm. So allowing and enabling corporates mm. to make sure that they pose as development partners mm. in equipping schools from foundation phase right through to tertiary. Because you'll find that the gap from primary to high school education to the tertiary is completely vast. And we're all aware of this as corporates um, within the public sector and private sector as well. Mm -hmm. So I would urge our, our corporates to make sure that they are ensuring that they're making proper corporate social responsibility programs that mm -hmm. have identified gaps within the schooling system mm -hmm. so that by the time our you know, future leaders are coming into the, the space, they are equipped enough and enabled within those spaces. Thank you. I, I mean, I think the question you were asking is very, very important, and I don't want to particularly choose uh, which of the panelists must answer, but there's a question about whether we are not emphasizing the importance of investing in a girl child from whether it's education or all the other interventions. What about the work that is meant to be done with boy kids. Are we, are we underplaying the work that is supposed to be done in that respect? Your thoughts? Sure, I'm going to try to be politically correct. On this <laughs> um, but from my research, what I found is in a number of studies, uh, when you impact a female, the Direct impact, of course, is realized. You're helping the one person. But the indirect as well as the induced impact of assisting a female spans far broader than what we see in their male counterparts. This being said, and of course, I think we are very short-sighted often mm -hmm. um, in interventions. And as the Telcom Foundation, we were very intent that we travel a five-year-long journey with our learners, starting from grade eight all the way up until matric and further beyond post-schooling. Why you need a, a longer term um, approach in doing this is because things do take time. 
Um, and true, and I can say in-depth support comes with time. Mm -hmm. So what you find, and we can truly attest, is one of our the chief invest chief IT officer, mm -hmm. Mahoshi, mm -hmm. was actually a beneficiary of the Telcom Foundation. Mm -hmm. And she tells a very heartfelt story about how she comes from a rural village, had no exposure to IT and what that was, but received a Telcom bursary. She was then afforded the opportunity to go to a Quintal 4 plus school, um, which then gave her the opportunity to further her studies through uh, varsity. Mahoshi now not only supports her immediate family, but her entire rural community at large, as mm. she then nominated her previous school as a beneficiary of the Telcom Foundation. Mm. So when you zoom out and take a, a zoom out lens, you find that actually Mahoshi's son is an indirect or induced a beneficiary and when you empower the woman you then empower the child mm -hmm. so over time hopefully we'll see in society then those shifts um, that then support women thank you tony can i maybe just ask a question that talks to technology and the gender disparities that we are seeing that we've been reflecting on in the morning is it your view that actually technology widens the gaps that we see between men and women? Yes, it does. Um, perhaps, you know, we could look at the most pervasive ICD tool, which is the mobile phone. Mm. Um, this is the tool that will bridge the digital divide globally. It is the tool that will bank the unbanked populace. Uh, it is the tool that will bring learning to those that cannot access, you know, learning platforms on a computer. And if we can just zoom in on the mobile phone and look at its um, accessibility by mm. gender, you will see that um, in most communities, it's mostly men mm. that have access and control mm. of the mobile phone. Mm. And that's just a very simple example to show the gender divide that exists. Um, you look at households, uh, I, I mean, maybe South Africa is not a good example, but like if you look at a developing country context like Malawi, where I come from, uh, a household is going to have a mobile phone but in terms of access and control, mm. it's the men um, that will have access and control of that resource. And so that's a very good example of the gender divide and the disparity that exists in terms of you know, access to technology, mm. simply put. Mm. Thanks. You, you had a question? Uh, I wanted to make an observation. Mm. <laughs> yes. mm. Thank you. My name is Hani Amanda. I'm with the Campaign for Free Expression. Mm. Uh, mine was an observation based on uh, the, the, the presentation made by Tony, mm. right? Where you said um, what limits us is not the is the, the breadth is the breadth of our imagination, not necessarily our upbringing or where we come from. Mm. And I just wanted to challenge that a little bit because I think. Um, you know, the importance of early childhood development, for example. So the brain, the human brain, I think in the first zero to two years, that's when it is most um, sponge-like, adaptable. Mm. Like you can basically mold a person into what they will become as an adult. Mm. So if they don't get exposure to, like, even if it's not necessarily opportunities, but, you mm. know, just the affirmation they need, which often takes um, a person that has had those opportunities, that has had that kind of exposure to know the importance of instilling these kind of... Um, qualities into a child as they grow up. Mm -hmm. So can we then say that what limits us is not really our upbringing, but the, because for me to be able to dream wildly, somebody must have instilled that within me growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll let Tony come um, to respond. I just want to take two more hands and then we're going to have a last round of questions, sir. Oh, I'm um, sorry, you had your hand up first and then I'll come to. Okay, good morning everyone. My question is um, aligned with what let's say I'm a mother. Hmm. Your decision making in the household how easy is it for a girl child to make decisions independently hmm. without bombard being bombarded with the chores because I think as mothers we are present from this morning and how do we meet, motivate them as kids in our households before they can go out there? Okay. Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Ufezegile. Um, So a very quick backstory. 
I come from the South Coast, the like lower South Coast, uh, where we were privileged um, to go to an education system in that area where um, technology was emphasized, right? Mm. So the one thing, though, that I do appreciate is that um, they didn't uh, make, they made sure that we still maintained our manual, like, chores and duties, etc. And I was listening where I may have misunderstood um, the mm. conversation where it was talking about chores um, as if they are a hindrance. Whereas you look at places like Taiwan, China, etc., places where technologically they're advancing, it's a co-ed education system where people are balancing the technology aspect and um, the chores, the manual labor, not hopefully not in a bad way where it's now abusive, but still keeping those two balanced because, and then also what you end up finding there is that the morality factor of it as well um, is also in check because people are now part of a community. When you're doing chores, someone has to do this, someone has to do that, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you just sit in front of your computer the whole day, I mean, you look at people now on social media, how morality is out of the window. So my question around that is then, how do we find that balance in the education system where we still keep people using their hands, their feet, their heads, whatever, while building the future that they should be building? Thank you. One last question. Um, the lady in red. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Gugu, and I'm from Young Urban Women. So my question is, for instance, I have not been exposed in technology that much, especially when it comes to my high school phase. And I was not taught the importance of math and science related to technology. So then when it came to subject choosing in grade nine, I chose what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So right now growing up, that's when you get to know the importance of technology and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So right, let's say I want to proceed in my technology knowledge, like I want to go through technology and coding and whatnot, mm -hmm. but then I cannot do that because of the minimum requirements in varsities or colleges. How do you then deduce that for people like me who are not exposed in technology from the foundation phase to, um, to high school? How do we then accommodate ourselves with the people that were exposed? And how mm -hmm. do you make us blend in mm -hmm. with technology in terms of teaching us from, from the foundation that this is technology and this is what technology brings out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very important question. And maybe let's start with that question. If she knew what she knows now, she probably would have made a different decision about where she wants to be in her career. Mm. Is it too late for her? Is there anything that can be done to bring her up so that she too can be fit for the future, if we were to put it bluntly? Yeah, it's not too late. Mm. Um, it's never too late. The good thing about um, technology and coding is there are plenty coding resources online mm. where you can learn how to code. And actually, the beauty of it is you can even teach yourself. You don't necessarily need anybody. Um, but obviously, yes, being part of a community like a technology hub, like the initiatives that mm. the Telcom Foundation is doing, if there's any such um, you know, initiative within the locality, being part of that community is certainly going to make you feel present. Mm. Um, and engaged and supported, but it's not too late. However, her point raises the gap within the formal education system mm. in its ability to integrate young people that might not necessarily have the formal prerequisites mm. to get in into certain career paths, but do have the passion, the will, and the skills. Mm. Um, I'm coming from Lesotho. Uh, we're working on the technology um, for their elections monitoring. They just voted last Friday, mm. came back yesterday. The young man that I was working with, it was a two-man team. We built up the system and managed it to, together, just the two of us. Does not have a diploma, mm. does not have a college degree, but he is one of the best coders mm. that I know. Mm. Self-taught, no formal education. I'm not saying that is the right way to get it, but mm. it's a good example of saying mm. he's still breaking the ceilings and the barriers, despite the fact that the formal education system has not given to him what he deserves. Mm. And I think it's a challenge to the government and policymakers mm. to develop technical qualification frameworks that can integrate such young people who are talented and skilled. 
but probably they haven't done the mathematics prerequisites mm. to get into a computer science degree. I hope that helps. Um, and maybe let's just reflect on the question that was asked um, by the gentleman sitting in the back. I guess what I'm hearing, if I heard him correctly, is probably a point about the overemphasis of technology and how we potentially could fall into a gap of losing out on skills that are necessary that might not be technology driven. Mm -hmm. uh, we have TVET colleges, we have those sort of colleges that are meant to push those sort of skills uh, in our economy. Is there anything that we could take from his example? Um, he was speaking, I think you were speaking about Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Taiwan and China. And the emphasis they have on both the use of technology and the focus on those very important skills. Um, Busi, do you want to take a step at that question? Thank you, we'll do. Uh, thank you for your question. And I, I think you're right. There is a requirement and need for balancing the two. The issue is the initial point you made was around household chores and the fact that we are now looking at them and saying we shouldn't be participating. I think the issue is over emphasis and prioritization of those household chores, particularly for the girl child. Mm. If the parents are more conscious with boy and girl children in how they distribute and allocate those chores around the house and mm. not place over emphasis and prioritization mm. on them, then we could potentially strike a balance in that mm. regard. Mm. Tony, there was a question specifically to you, um, and I guess it was more of a challenge. You made a statement that suggested something about beyond your imagination. Do you want to reflect on that one? Not a problem, and I think uh, history uh, will help me uh, solve this just in the work that we do at the foundation. Um, initially in 2017, when we entered into these environments, we thought with great enthusiasm, we're going to give people laptops, we're going to change their world. We're going to expose them to the future of tech. When we arrived on the ground, we found the complete opposite. Um, our learners were actually ailed by a myriad of social ills that actually prohibited them from even, you know, doing their reading and, you know, uh, reading and numeracy at school. I mean, at a grade three level, not even to have the thought capacity to think beyond uh, the next subject. Um, issues of malnutrition issues of child-headed households, mm. um, issues of teenage pregnancy, substance abuse is rife um, in our Gauteng uh, townships. And really what we found is that we really need to support holistically mm. and leverage. We knew that the telecom were in tech and we're not professionals in, in terms of psychosocial, but levering, leveraging the strength of our partners. So since then we've partnered with Childline, we've partnered with FAMSA in the PE. We've also partnered with Childline South Africa. And through these partners, we were able to offer uh, the much needed social workers uh, based at the schools, as well as online support. As you can find, some learners um, are very restricted in sharing or even opening up. What we found is once you deal with sustenance issues, you then have space and room to deal with the mind. And I think that's the point of departure upon which I made the quote that then the geographical or the physical condition in which you find yourself no longer become as a barrier, but with the right resources to support that, we can now stretch and think beyond um, mm -hmm. that environment. I also just wanted to note that I know there was a girl, Asimash, she mm -hmm. dreamt of going to Harvard, but uh, from her small location in PE, that was not an opportunity. I mean, she needs to have a passport visa, finances were very strapped. But through technology and online learning, we now have Harvard X, which actually offers free online programs to all um, at no cost. I mean, you just need the cost to entry being access to a smartphone or a device, mm -hmm. as well as connectivity. And with that access as a base, mm -hmm. you're then able to venture far beyond what you even dreamt you could travel to mm -hmm. um, as a society. So I think mm -hmm. that's the spirit in which the quotation was made. Thanks, Tony. Um, there was a question about decision-making in a girl child. Um, Dr. Rachel, I don't know if you want to venture into answering that question. Yeah, I think the, the short of it is, like I said earlier, charity begins at home. Um, 
any child will trust their parent or the guardian um, that looks after them in what they tell them. It shapes you, it forms you. And you're right to say that what we tell our girls matters mm -hmm. in forming their opinions, in getting self-belief to take mm -hmm. on some of these subjects, as she mentioned. The home is a very fundamental place that will shape our views and perspectives um, of the subjects that we venture into, even of the careers mm -hmm. that we take. And so it's important, I think, um, for communities to constantly be reminded and engaged to let them you know, dream widely. Um, for me, although I grew up with parents that were uh, educated, but and although they encouraged me to work hard in all the other subjects, but when it came to careers, their encouragement was for traditional career paths. Mm -hmm. My father wanted me to be an accountant and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And it was really almost being rebellious to think of you know anything else outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to also build some independence, autonomy in thinking, and create a, um, a platform where girls can also, you know, put up contra views mm. to what the parents think. Mm. Like I had to have a very serious conversation with my dad. His point was, where are you going to work? You're just going to be a support person. Because mm. at the time, indeed, tech people were support. And in organizations, tech was like a subdivision of finance. Mm. And that is changing. So because they created an environment where we could debate and have a conversation. And I say to him, you know, I give me a chance. I want to do this. When I finish this, I'll do your accounting for you. Mm. And I really did that. Mm. <laughs> After my first degree, I did accounting just to please him. But I appreciate the fact that, you know, I was given the space mm. to debate, engage. But I know of colleagues who perhaps, you know, the mothers or the parents have actually said, if you don't do this, you're not getting our support. Mm. Like you can only go through these, you know, career paths. So it's important in terms of the messaging mm. that we put in our girls because it reinforces where they land and where they go. Mm. I'm cognizant that we don't have enough time left because there are other things, uh, other topics that we still have to, de to deliberate on. I'm going to ask that we take one or two last questions from the floor. I've already picked the lady um, in orange and the lady in blue. Maybe let's start with you, uh, Mem. You had a question that you wanted to ask. Thank you all. I uh, have loved hearing your, your sharing, the data and the uh, anecdotes. And I'm, I want to kind of bring it back to the systemic material of the girl child, which I think in many ways mm. begins at home, yeah. begins with the cultural norms. Mm. Uh, I'm also reflecting on some commentary I received as I grew up and some, some actions between and yes, all this is resonating. So how do you all have influence in that space so that families are thinking differently about tech and education and their girls? Mm -hmm. And then how do we do that? And how do we continue to have influence going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Margaret, Margaret Zulu. I am an opponent of gender-based violence but I'm also a proponent of high quality education and skills building. I'm also a mother of a nine year old daughter, so you can read my passion. Mm. Uh, you've spoken a lot about programs and initiatives um, targeting girls, but I'm just wondering um, how are we mobilizing and engaging communities in ensuring that we build a nonviolent learning environment? And some of the violence that we have seen include emotional, physical, uh, sexual abuse against mm. our girls and, and women, but also cyberbullying uh, when it comes to tech. Um, could you please share what is um, what you've done about that? Thank you so much. Thank you. Can can I ask you, um, Busi, to reflect on the question the lady was asking about the role we could potentially play in dealing with some of these systemic issues by targeting not just children in the schools, but also dealing with stakeholders within society, families included, organizations, and so on and so on. How do we, how do we influence those areas in a way that tackles 
these systemic issues that we've spoken about. Mm, thank you, sir. Thank you for the, for the question. I think it's a very important one, especially because it really does start at home. I think, first of all, it's being able to, to challenge the everyday thinking from a domestic family mm. uh, life. For instance, we spoke about the balance between uh, chores and taking st time for, for studies and, and school. So if the mom or the dad is saying to the girl child, well, you can only look at your schoolwork once you've prepared a meal, you can challenge that. And we, in these privileged positions as, and as educated people, we need to start having that intellectual conversation within mm. the family household first uh, to start off with. And then I think also being able to challenge our social um, and friendship circles as well in how, how they how they think and how they see the girl child in comparison to, to the boy child. But it does start in, in discussions and conversations and being able to, to challenge the thinking most importantly. Mm. Can I add on to her? Mm. Yeah, you read my mind. So <laughs> first conversations, but I think secondly also is uh, modeling mm. um, and bringing to light examples Mm. of those that have broken those ceilings and just being able to show that not even the sky should be the limit at mm. all, mm. but in reality. Mm. Yeah. Tony, did you want to say something? Yes, I think uh, we found in our project that parental involvement became actually a very huge strategic pillar for us mm -hmm. um, in that we were not only impacting the child, but the family unit in which they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And in educating the child, we found that there was a disparity now within the household. Child was coming home with the fancy laptop, you know, <laughs> doing funny things, connecting the TVs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a parent's natural response was that of someone of authority is to really meet that with defiance or, you know, punishment, right? Mm -hmm. But they're actually acting from a point of not knowing. Mm -hmm. So it was once we educated the parents as well, we scheduled mm -hmm. Zoom team meetings with the parents using the device. It became a familial activity. Mm -hmm. So everyone was then involved. And in so doing and really building genuine relationships with people, be it the parents as well as the communities. Mm -hmm. We had great instances of theft. We had deployed beautiful computer labs. Um, taken through the feelings of youth. Yeah, these get very creative mm. these days. Mm. But once we engage the people that live next door to safeguard the... the, the or Actually, it was mm. in demonstrating the impact of technology mm. that they took it upon themselves to safeguard the assets because mm. they had a sense of belonging. Mm. It's for them. And at the end of the day, it's for the benefit of their surrounding communities. Mm. Mm. On the issue of gender-based violence, um, a lot has been written about, a lot has been said around just how much pain gets inflicted on women just by virtue of who they are. How do we, just in response to the question, how do we tackle that issue and how do we tackle gender-based violence also just by looking at that as an issue that's arising in the, we call it the social streets. Um, social media, there's a lot of cyber bullying, there's a lot of cyber violence that's happening. How can we as people involved in these areas of work deal with these um, issues? Maybe I'll start. Um, I think it's all about conversations as she had said. We have to challenge the narratives mm. around what you know is perceived as norms, mm. and yet it is gender-based violence. Um, we see, like with social media um, cyberbullying, mm. it is just a reflection of who we are really in the physical space. It's just a transition to an online space. And so these conversations have to continue. Um, there's also a role about you know legal and regulatory frameworks mm. to ensure that there's enforcement mm. um, for those that are perpetrators of gender-based violence. Mm. I mean, it sets precedence and deters, you know, other perpetrators that have to come. Um, but also increasing the voices of those that can stand up to challenge these norms. Because mm. sometimes you see even with uh, cyberbullying, um, people become isolated, particularly the victims. Mm. And there's very little voices to um, support them in, in that space. So we need to enhance uh, more voices to rise up and amplify 
the message that speaks against gender-based violence, and I'm particularly now more zoned in on issues of cyberbullying, mm. um, because it's a space that's really affecting the mental health mm. of many young people. Mm. I'll just pause there and maybe hear what colleagues have to say. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. A very good question as well. Uh, I think for me personally, it's being able to, to call people out. Uh, mm. These are people that we know, the perpetrators specifically, mm. whether it's a friend of a friend or it's an uncle or a brother, it's being able to call people out because mm. I think in most cases, people assume that gender-based violence happens, you know, adjacent to them and not necessarily within mm. the, the space and, and social context. So that would be the, the, the starting point. And again, agreeing with your with your sentiments is continuing the, the conversations and, and and discussions, but being able to raise the voices of those who have been uh, victims and why it's important, most of importantly, to 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 call those who are are doing these things. Thank you, Tony. Um, all while not an immediate solution. Um, we do find in research that abuse is very, I can say, almost proportionately tied to economic status or, or stability. Mm -hmm. So in environments where you find that women are economically dependent, I mean, just for your sus survival and sustenance on a man, mm -hmm. you then find yourself in a position where you're vulnerable to whatever that man deems is worthy of you being treated, right? Mm -hmm. So the moment we empower uh, females with education and understanding a sense of self and importance of self, mm -hmm. we find that they're able to stand up and rise up against it, as my colleagues here have so duly mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the proliferation of this with the advent of social media. So I do feel like this is a present time for us to launch such campaigns as you would find in the Me Too movement um, in Hollywood, where women banded up together and with a joint voice were able mm -hmm. then to take down, you know, powerful likes of Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. So the more we talk and have such conversations and really denormalize mm -hmm. uh, the abuses of, against women, mm -hmm. hopefully in our near future and my children will see a different Africa and a different world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. And colleagues, please join me in really thanking our panelists for taking the time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time and for sharing such insightful um, views around the issues that we are. I'm hoping that somebody or somewhere in the tech, somebody was taking notes about some of the powerful points that you raised, particularly around actions that we can take based on the views that you've, you've shared with us here. Thank you very much. I think, um, I'm not sure where the program director is. I'm assuming that we're going on a on a brief break. Is it a brief break? For how long? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So my understanding is that we're taking a 15 minutes break. We are now on 10 past 11. So we should be back by half past. And um, when we come back, I think there'll be a new panel dealing with a different topic. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Plato said, Who will guard the guardians? Who are our guardians? Do they care about us? Are they accountable for their actions? Or are they above the law? Who elects these guardians? Us? Them? Someone else? And if they guard us, who will guard them? Who will guard the guardians, the mail-in guardian, if you really want to know?